Dr. Anthony Chafee. Welcome to the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show. What's going on, dude? Uh, not much. No, just uh, on my trip to US. I was down in your neck of the woods down in Phoenix last weekend, now back up in Seattle. How are you? I'm doing great. It's been obviously a long time since we've seen each other. For context, we used to play rugby together uh, years and years ago. Um, so I'm at my kids rugby practice uh, several months ago. And our friend, John Gray, who we both played with, grew up playing with, he and I are having a conversation. He's like, hey, have you talked to Chafee lately? Hmm. I'm like, no. Like, I'm like, why? He's like, well, because Chafee's like this huge carnivore advocate and he's a neurosurgeon. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and so, dude, I started to dig in and I'm like, wow, this is, a, this is incredible. Like what you've been up to over the past, what, 20 years now. Hmm. So let's, let's jump in, fill us in. You were obviously playing rugby. You were playing internationally. Were you into health and nutrition? Like while we were playing together? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I almost exclusively ate meat, um, even at, at Red Mountain, I, I sort of slipped off of it at that time. Um, you know, I almost really almost never drank uh, since I turned 21, like it was, um, uh, just, it, I just felt so much different, so much better, you know, w with, with my athletics and recovering from games. If I just didn't drink at all. So I was like, yeah. I'm not going to do that. I stopped eating plants around the same time. And, and then when I was in, when I was in Arizona, I was still almost exclusively eating meat, but maybe, maybe it would dip off of it, you know, a bit without really noticing. I didn't get like massive the Los Burritos burritos or something like that. And I Los Burritos late night <laughs> when uh, we'd be yeah. out celebrating after playoffs. Yeah. Let, let me ask, what was the impetus to even like go down this road in the first place? Yeah, so it was it was quite it was quite strange uh, and and quite fortunate. Um, I took a, a class in in um, cancer biology at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I had taken biology and botany in different classes. And so I knew that that a plant's main defense and deterrent against predation is, is actually making chemicals and poisons. Um, plants as a, as a group make around a million different toxic chemicals that they use to stop animals and insects from eating them. They can be deadly or, or cause disruption in a number of other ways, mess with their hormones, mess with their digestion, make it so certain nutrients aren't available, like phytic acid will bind. Like anti, what we call anti-nutrients. Anti-nutrients, yeah, exactly. So it'll bind to nutrients so that you can't absorb them. You know, tannins will do this as well. Uh, they'll bind to proteins or phytic acid will bind to different nutrients. And then that's an unbreakable bond to us. We don't have the, the physiology and biochemistry and, and different enzymes to, to break down these bonds. So they're, they're not accessible to us. So, you know, a plant may have certain nutrients in it, but it's trying to keep them away from you because it doesn't want you to benefit from eating them. And so you may eat them. It may have a lot of iron. It may have a lot of magnesium or B12 or not B12, but like B, B3 or something like that, but it's not accessible to you. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the defenses. Some of the other defenses are actually being toxic. They will, they will make poisons and toxins that can, they can harm you or even kill you. Like ricin is a lectin that's in uh, castor beans. That's the most poisonous thing that we know of. It, you know, one microgram per kilogram of body weight can kill basically any animal. And so this is highly, highly toxic. And there are so many others, so many others. And so I, I sort of knew this, you know, you learn this and I mean, literally seventh grade biology learned that plants and animals are in an evolutionary arms race. Plants mm -hmm. become more and more poisonous. So less and less animals can eat them so they can survive and thrive. And then animals becoming more and more adapted to specific poisons and defenses in specific plants. So they can eat that plant and survive and thrive. That's their uh, dedicated food source. They're not competing for resources and they're, and they're safe to eat it. Learn that in seventh grade. And then you go home and get to eat your vegetables and you don't, you don't actually connect the two. Right. So then we were in cancer biology. I think it was around 20. And we were learning again, the same principle that plants use defense chemicals to stop predation and to survive. And some of these things can be carcinogenic or mutagenic. This isn't a secret. This is, this is in many botany books, uh, textbooks. This is on the WHO website. They have a whole website talking about the different plant defense chemicals and some are mutagenic, some are carcinogenic. And we were going through them in, from that cancer perspective, looking at the different carcinogens that were available in just normal plants and produce. So for instance, Brussels sprouts 20 years ago, had already discovered, we had already discovered 136 known human carcinogens in Brussels sprouts. 
over 100 in mushrooms and spinach, kale, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, broccoli, all the different produce items that you may eat. We were given page after page after page of all the different sorts of plants that you may encounter uh, on your dinner plate with the number of carcinogens that have been identified in them. And they were quite abundant. We know from the work of Professor Bruce Ames from UC Berkeley in the 1980s that the naturally occurring toxins in plants that they use as natural insecticides and pesticides, they develop these things millions of years before humans even existed. And so, you know, they, they've been around for a very long time. And that those naturally occurring pesticides and insecticides outweighed the industrial pesticides that we sprayed on them by a factor of 10,000. And that the naturally occurring uh, toxins uh, were much more likely to cause cancer than the pesticides. So specifically in that study, it was looking at uh, mushrooms, like just white table mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And uh, ALAR was the specific pesticide. So mushrooms were 500 times more carcinogenic than this pesticide, ALAR. And um, and that's why we still use these pesticides. They were actually trying to ban these things. And they were like, well, wait a minute, the plant, the plant is, is actually worse. And so if you're going to eat the plant, pesticide is actually you know, a drop in the bucket. And so we were quite taken aback by this. We were obviously very shocked. I remember looking around while we were all looking around wildly, trying to see who was in on the joke, see if there's like a TA, like snickering in the corner. Mm. And he always does this, but there wasn't. And, and it finally dawned on us that this guy was serious. And I remember just sort of sitting there stunned, thinking to myself, well, but, but vegetables are still good for you though, right? Even though they have all this mess in them. And he just looked at us and he just said, yeah, I, I don't eat salads. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. I was like, right, you know, forget plants. And I just stopped. Mm. I went to the grocery store that day. I just went around. It was like everything in the grocery store was just was made you know, with or from plants. Sure. Early. And so I just came across eggs. I came across, um, you know, meat and milk. And I was just like, okay, this is all I'm eating. And so for the next several years, I just ate eggs, meat, and milk. And, um, and, uh, and I felt amazing. I felt absolutely incredible doing that. I was able to perform much better athletically. I felt much better athletically and uh, I could go a lot harder. I got a lot more out of the workouts that I did. I recovered much quicker. I didn't get sore. I don't get sore after working out. That's something that's pretty remarkable that people get. I, for some reason, that one makes people more angry than anything else. They're like, you do sore, you shut up. Man. So you've uh, adapted this eating philosophy over the last 20 years. And obviously you started before this was coined as being anything you know, dietarily related. I mean, obviously we've had sort of the ketogenic diet has gone through cycles for, you know, decades. Um, yeah. and, and so I kind of want to talk about the, the relationship here to the ketogenic diet. However, this is what the way that you eat right now, the way you promote is called the carnivore diet. And like in a nutshell, what does that constitute? Yeah. So it's really just, just meat based, high fat, no plant material, basically. So the way I do it is, um, I think it's as it's, it's important what not to eat as what to eat. Sometimes mm -hmm. eat on a diet and they'll just eat a lot more meat, which is great. I mean, that's where you get all your nutrients from. That's where you get your nutrition from. That's very, very important. But then they still sort of eat other things. It's like, ah, it's that big of a deal. Well, it's not as big of a deal as if you, as if you were eating more of those plants and then not eating as much meat. So you're, again, you're in, going in the right direction. But all of these different plants, they all have different chemicals. They all have certain things that can slow you down and deter your uh, your optimal health and 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 um, and disrupt that. And so I really like just being very very clean, pure meat and water. And so I think it's you know so my hard rule is no plants, no sugar, nothing artificial, and that goes for sauces, seasonings, and drinks as well. And sugar, I would, I would mean any sort of sweetener at all, because sometimes people will often mm -hmm. include different sweeteners, various forms, stevia, monk fruit, sugar, sure. uh, all the different, you know, fake um, you know, sugars and sweeteners and things like that. I think those, those aren't a good idea. I think that they can really hold you back. And a lot of people that struggle with weight loss or other issues, when they go on a carnivore, they, oh, it's not really working for me. I feel great. I'm reversing my autoimmune conditions. I'm off medications, but I'm not really losing weight. So it didn't work for me. You ask them, they're almost always still using artificial sweeteners or they're eating a ton of dairy, which is mm. fine uh, to eat dairy. But I think it's um, 
it's not as good as meat. And so, you know, I think that really just meat is the meal, just eating meat, not being afraid of the fat. Fat's very important. It's not just a calorie source. It's a, an essential nutrient and it has a lot right. of essential nutrients in it. And so I think that um, that's a very important. So eating fatty whole meats and just drinking water is the, I think that's the optimal way of doing it. Um, you know, and it's, you know, with, with ruminant animal red meat is, is generally better than others. So we're generally eating, uh, almost exclusively red meat, higher fat red meat. Um, and that's, that's essentially it. Um, mm-hmm. I obviously understand and and I'm hearing kind of the, the ideology around, you know, plants, defense mechanism, quote unquote toxins. Now what's, what about this sort of rationale and, you know, what we clearly understand around breaking down the the, the toxins or breaking down the anti-nutrients through cooking, through fermentation, through the aging process, like degrading the fibers in those plant mechanisms to be able to make them more digestible, to then be able to uh, be able to digest, absorb, and assimilate the nutrients. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that, and that, that can help quite significantly. And those are, those are techniques uh, that we have used traditionally for thousands of years to get more nutrition and, and less toxic effects from the plants. So fermentation is huge. Now, that's a big thing with, with soy. People use a lot of soy and they think, oh, soy is so great. Soy is not great. So no, soy is not great. <laughs> soy is a, yeah, a ton of these defense chemicals. And they also have a lot of phytoestrogens that can, okay. that can mimic estrogen and, uh, and give you an estrogenic response. So there are, what is it like 20 times the amount of, um, of phytoestrogens than the, in three ounces of soy than the birth control pill. No, thanks. You know, and, um, you know, so it's, it's quite a lot. Um, I think so, I heard uh, one doctor say that eight glasses of soy milk a day was enough estrogen to grow breast in a man. So this is not insignificant, especially if you're eating this as a, as a major source so in Asia, they often don't eat just normal soy. They eat fermented soy and that right. And degrade a lot of these things as well. And they use it. This is not like a staple diet. This is, this was more an emergency ration that they could have and store and, and use, you know, if they were starving, which they, you know, they had, they've had to go through a lot of famines in their, in their history. So there are all these different processes and those are, those are very important. And so I think that if you do eat plants, that that's what you should definitely be doing. You should be doing these sorts of processes. So for, for instance, you know, we know tamales, right. That comes from the word nishtamalization, which is one of these processes that people in Mesoamerica used to mm-hmm. treat uh, and cure corn um, traditionally. And so I think they like soak it in lye for like 24 hours, do a couple other things to it. And this would detoxify it, but it would also open up a lot of nutrients it would allow, I think, niacin uh, to become more bioavailable. And when you don't do that, these nutrients are not bioavailable. And you don't get them and you can get deficiencies. So when we adopted, when the Europeans adopted corn from Mesoamerica, brought it back to Europe, they brought the crop, but they didn't bring back the, the treatment and the way that right. the, the native people used them and, and processed them, which was a bad idea because it was very cheap. It was very easy to grow. And so this ended up becoming a, a staple food of the poor. And so they didn't have a lot of other access to nutrients and so they're just eating corn. They're not going through this process of nishtamalization. And so they were getting something called pellagra, which is a vitamin deficiency of niacin. And people were dying and their skin was sloughing off. They had all these sorts of uh, problems and they thought it was some sort of disease and infection. And they, they spent decades looking for the cause of this, of this infection. And someone figured out, no, actually, this is a vitamin deficiency um, from eating a ton of corn. The, the irony of this is, is that corn actually has a ton of niacin in it. It's just bound up, yeah. right? The it's plant does not want, it, right? Yeah, exactly. So you have to go through that, that process of nishtamalization. So that I think is, is very important when we're, when we're understanding plants is that you have to go through a process. You have to process these things to detoxify them. Cooking lectins, a lot of lectins are, are heat sensitive. So you can cook out the lectins, but they aren't necessarily all going to get out. Totally. That, from that cooking process and other things aren't, aren't heat sensitive at all. So, but there are things that you can do like kidney beans, right? So WHO actually says this, that if you eat as little as five uncooked or even undercooked kidney beans, because undercooked kidney beans can actually be more toxic than uncooked kidney beans. Um, 
that the lectins in those kidney beans can put you in the hospital. Five kidney beans can put you in the hospital if not prepared properly. So there are there are significant toxins in these in these plants, and and we have to understand that if you are going to consume them, you need to be very very mindful of that, and you need to go through these processes. You need to be able to process them and and put them through these chemical industrial processes to detoxify them and extract optimal nutrients. Well, what does that tell us from a biological standpoint? That tells us that we are not designed to eat these things because if we were designed to eat these things, our body would go through, would do those chemical detoxifications and would be able to, to unleash those nutrients. So we are not, we are by definition, not designed to eat these foods all yeah. Have, yeah, have, have something that they're designed to eat. And this, we are, we can eat a lot of things us specifically, which is great. We have, we have more leeway than say like a lion a lion doesn't get meat. It's dead. It can't eat really any plants. And so, you know, we have that as a survival mechanism, but I think we need to understand that, that this is for survival. We can do this in case we need to, but for optimal health, we should eat what we're designed to eat, which is meat. Yeah. Listen, I think that's, that's perfectly fair. You know, at the end of the day, it's also like, well, we also can eat fucking potato chips and pop tarts. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, and someone will say, oh, well, I eat those things and I'm, I do fine or I look good with my shirt off or, or whatever. And, and so I, I 100% agree with you around it's like, listen, our, our, our bodies, our physiology is pretty remarkable in terms of what we can survive with. We know this very mm-hmm. clearly from just the concepts of like metabolic flexibility of being able to adapt from fat burning to more carbohydrate burning to be able to fast for extended periods of time you know, to be able to uh, you know, pull out nutrients to some degree from from the foods that that we consume. Um, so like, what do you see as being like the main goals for people to start eating more of a, a, a carnivore based diet? Is it health related? Is it weight loss related? Is it performance related? Like, what would you typically see as the impetus to go that direction? Quite a lot of people come to it for weight loss. Uh, other others are for health benefits as well. I do it just because I know that these things have things that are harmful and I don't want to put that in my body. Yeah. I, want, I want to be as healthy as I possibly can be. And and seeing the difference, seeing the contrast, how much better I feel. It's not a small thing. It's, I, right. I feel remarkably better than I ever have before. I, I, I tell people, I, I feel like a different breed of human. And in a lot of ways I am because my body's working very differently than everyone else. And, you know, when I, when I came across this again, um, you know, because I sort of slipped off of it, um, actually, you know, a bit in, in Arizona, but also when I went to England after that, when I just really didn't have the same access to meat and some of it was breaded and like, Ugh, what do I do? And, um, and I, uh, I, I sort of slipped off of it at that point. And then sort of five years ago, came back onto it, you know, full on when I realized, no, actually humans really are carnivores biologically. That's just the kind of animal that we are. And this is, this is optimal for us. And so I got rid of all the plants and started eating a lot more meat and again, felt amazing. And I remember after a few weeks when this sort of it, all that junk had gotten out of my system, I remember it just how much better I felt. And I thought to myself, I was like, I look back on the rest of my life. I was like, I realized that except for those sort of five years in my early twenties, I basically felt like garbage, mm-hmm. you know, comparatively. And so I, and I felt robbed. I was like, I shouldn't feel like this. I should, I should never have felt like that. I should always felt amazing like this. We all should have, you know, the natural state of humanity is healthy. And yet 92% of Americans have at least one metabolic illness, 70% of Americans yeah. overweight or obese. And we are not, we are, we are not even top 10 there. You know, like it's, that's, that's scary to think about. Um, so a lot of people come to it from, from weight loss and it, it works very, very well, but I don't think that's, that's why people should do it. I think they should, yes, you'll lose weight. Yes. You'll lose body fat. Yes. You'll put on muscle and uh, bone density. And so you'll gain good weight. You'll lose unhealthy weight, but the overall message is health, optimal health. And a lot of people are coming to that as well, especially with autoimmune issues, uh, diabetes. I mean, this has been clinically proven that you can reverse type two diabetes and perfectly control type one diabetes with a ketogenic diet. And a carnivore diet is a ketogenic diet when, when done properly. I don't, I don't, I I do think that you should avoid carbohydrates uh, as well. So you should be, it, it should be a subset of a ketogenic diet and, um, but athletic performance as well. More and more athletes are coming around to see this uh, as as an extra edge that they can get on their competition, and an extra way and a, and a way for them to get their performance better and better and better. I certainly noticed that, 
as an athlete. And I've, I've relayed those uh, stories to people. Uh, you know, Dr. Sean Baker, he's just a, an amazing athlete. And he is finding that his performance is just next level, whereas he was, you know, he was gaining weight. He was pre-diabetic, uh, I believe. And, you know, as, a, as an orthopedic surgeon, just sort of getting bigger and unhealthier and trying to do all the right thing, eating his veggies, eating whole foods, doing all that. It was just getting worse and worse. And oh, I'm just mm-hmm. getting, now the guy's shredded. You know, and this is very muscular and, uh, and and just killing it and breaking records left, right and center. So um, people are seeing that and more top athletes are are coming uh, to us and say, hey, how do I get on this? What do you suggest? I worked with a guy, uh, Ryan Talbot, really nice kid. Uh, he's over at um, uh, Michigan State and he's a D1 um, decathlete. And so he went carnivore last year. And after sort of six months of this, on his second decathlete, he won the Big Ten championship for NCAA one, and uh, and earned All American honors. Absolutely, absolutely massive performance. And obviously, he's he is a, an exceptional athlete himself already. But he said that this really took him to the next level. He said that doing carnivore uh, turned him into the athlete he always you know knew he could be and always wanted to be. You know what I'm curious about is like how much of it do you attribute to the inclusion of significantly more protein and fat, uh, red meat, protein and fat. And how much of is it, is it attributed to just removing all of the shit that we mm-hmm. consume on a daily basis? Obviously it's both, but yeah. how is someone not going to, and, and listen, I, obviously it's like towards the end, uh, you know, end of the spectrum, right? It's like, mm-hmm. I just eat meat. Obviously we have the other end of the spectrum is like vegan, right? Mm-hmm. So both of those to do it correctly is, is removing the, the process garbage, yeah. garbage, trans fats, you know, oils, um, shit like that. So I, I think we can absolutely can make a huge case for every single person that's sort of toggling in, in no man's land is going to improve by virtue of just giving themselves yeah. the opportunity to remove mm. a lot of that, a lot of that junk. And so it makes a lot of sense how, like you said, a lot of people go that direction for weight loss. Well, right. Because how are you not going to lose weight when you one, remove a significant portion of highly processed calories from your diet, you massively ramp up your protein intake, which is terribly satiating for Mm. you. And, and frankly, not that calorically dense per volume. But like mm-hmm. I said, massively satiating. Most people aren't eating enough relative to their body weight, performance, body composition goals. And then of course you're you're you know you're adding in healthier fats as well. That's also going to contribute to calories and satiety. Mm-hmm. So you know I think that's obviously one really big aspect of it. So carnivore is high protein, high fat. So invariably it is a ketogenic diet. Where do we see the role of saturated fat in, you know, blood lipids at what, is there a concern for the amount of saturated fat that someone's consuming? I know that like this, this idea of, of consuming animal fats and cholesterol has been debunked and and we don't need to go there, but I think there's still potentially a concern. I'd, I'd love kind of where you're at from a medical standpoint of where and if do we need to be concerned in terms of a saturated fat LDL cholesterol standpoint? What have you observed? Yeah, so great question. Obviously, this is something that has has driven people away from eating meat for decades now, and and driven people more towards a plant based diet. We're already eating a plant based diet anyway. It's just processed plants and carbs, yeah, totally that garbage. Um, you know, so some people say, well, when he went plant based, whatever, it's like, well, you probably didn't change too much the the percentage of calories you got from plants. It's just you changed the kind of plants that you got from. You know, they came from, you, know, you do a vegan diet, you know, eating, uh, you know, Oreo cookies and heroin, you know, I mean, those, those are all plant-based, right? You know, so that's, that's, I mean, I haven't had any heroin lately, but I've had a lot of Oreo cookies. Oreo cookies yeah. <laughs> well, well, there you go. You're, you're plant-based vegan. I mean, that's, part yeah, of, no, totally. I, I get it. Cheese pizza, very healthy. you know, pizza and whatever. Yeah. yeah. Garbage. Yeah, exactly. So, um, as far as saturated fat is concerned, I mean, that's, that's a major concern for people, but according to the journal of the American college of cardiology, you know, one of the top cardiology journals in the world, they published a, a large literature review and, um, a position paper in 2020, basically talking about saturated fat and how they said, like looking through all the literature, all the data, there is no upper limit on the amount of saturated fat you can eat for health. And actually it has no relation with heart disease, right? So 
there's no even correlation between saturated fat intake and heart disease. And so there's no upper limit on the amount of saturated fat that the, that the American College of Cardiology would, would recommend in this paper. And more than that, they found an inverse relationship with the amount of saturated fat you eat and your stroke rate. So the more saturated fat you eat, less likely you are to have a stroke. The less saturated fat you eat, more likely you are to have a stroke. Okay, so that's a big deal. And then more, re- and, and then also recently there was a meta-analysis looking at all the literature with LDL cholesterol, and they found again there's no there's no actual connection or correlation between higher LDL cholesterol and heart disease. In fact, they again found an inverse relationship. So what about LDL, like LDL particle size? I mean, and that, well, that's, that's a good, exactly. So there are like over a hundred different part, particle sizes. So when you say LDL, we're not really yeah, right, right, right. specific there. So a good, a good, I think that probably the only way of looking at, at cholesterol that has any sort of functional meaning is you look at your HDL and your triglycerides. If your HDL to triglyceride ratio is about one to one, or maybe even better yet, two to one HDL to triglycerides, you're in a very low risk. For heart disease. And so your LDL is going to be the large, buoyant, healthy LDL cholesterol. Remember the LDL cholesterol, we make it. This is important. This is, this is a normal, important molecule in our body. It doesn't just, just you know, have this in our, it's just killing you and causing uh, heart disease. No, this is, a, this is a normal molecule in our body. It can be damaged generally through glycation, which is mm-hmm. just have high blood sugar. Those glucose molecules physically fuse to different molecules. They damage them. This is what kills diabetics. So this is happening to your cholesterol as well. They'll knock off a, a receptor called ApoB100, and now your liver can't recognize it, and it'll turn into these small, dense LDL cholesterol. These are these are indicative. There's are more concerning for heart disease. Now there's not there's not any any evidence that they cause heart disease, but they they have a higher correlation. With heart disease, whereas like the large boy LDL cholesterol has like no correlation, right? Disease, or in fact, an inverse correlation. And so the small, dense LDL cholesterol can have a slightly increased uh, correlation, but you know, it's like 1.7 times, right? Whereas metabolic disease is six times and uh, diabetes is 10 times, right? So I think that the small, dense, you know, lipoprotein uh, particles are more the smoke and not the fire. This is an indication that your body's being damaged through glycation, through oxidation, from like seed oils and other sorts of things. And uh, in fact, are just, you know, showing you that you're damaging your body in other ways as well. Just like HbA1c, we use this to as a marker sure. of glycation in diabetics. This is, this is the glycation end product of uh, hemoglobin. And so we can measure this because your body regularly recycles your red blood cells roughly around every three months, though that can change. Um, it seems like in, in studies with carnivores, you are just more healthy and your red blood cells actually last longer. So they live longer than, than three months. And so your HbA1c may be a little higher, um, than you would, you would expect, not, not high by any stretch of the imagination, but, um, you know, like maybe high normal, but that's likely because, you know, they live longer. And so they have more time to be exposed to, to the glycation. So I don't think that, that saturated fat is something we need to worry about. Saturated fat is an essential nutrient. Our brain is made out of saturated mm-hmm. fats and cholesterol. Um, in fact, there are studies looking at dementia in, in patients. So they think they have Alzheimer's or dementia and they find they're all on these statins that actually cross the blood brain Blocks. Yeah. and disrupt, yeah. yeah, and disrupt a, a cholesterol um, metabolism in your brain. Your brain is made out of cholesterol. That's what you myelinate your axons out of partially, you know, partially uh, fat and cholesterol. And so when you're disrupting that, your brain's not going to be able to myelinate itself. It's not going to be able to you know, build itself up. It's going to degrade. And they found that this is reversible. They take these people off the statins and all of a sudden their brains start working again after several weeks. And then you put them back on the statins and they go back into having dementia. It's not dementia. This is, this is an effect of, of this drug, which is uh, quite harmful, obviously, in these, in these cases. And when we have copious amounts of data and studies and literature showing that LDL cholesterol is actually beneficial. You know, we, we, we decided that LDL was bad through actually quite nefarious means. They, they've since been debunked. Things like the Framingham study was misrepresented. That, that was taught to me in medical school that mm-hmm. Framingham study showed that higher amount of cholesterol, the higher amount of, of cardiovascular uh, accidents and, and disease. That was in fact the opposite. The, the Framingham study actually found higher LDL cholesterol, lower your risk, of heart disease and vice versa. And so the American Heart Association, two years after that was completed, misrepresented it and actually published it the opposite. And that's what made it to the textbooks. That was a complete 
bastardization and misrepresentation of the facts. And there are a number of other things, like the 1977 USDA declaration that cholesterol caused heart disease. That was written by a guy who we know was paid off. He was a Harvard professor, and he was paid off by the sugar companies. We have these contracts. He got paid $6,500 to do this. This was not disclosed. He was supposed. You're supposed to disclose, you know, any sort of conflicts of interest. You know, who paid for the study, all that sort of stuff. The sugar companies paid for these studies. The sugar company were paying him directly, and yet he never disclosed that. He said this was independent research. It was so he was a liar, and uh, and that was fraud and uh, absolute fraudulent. That was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2016, JAMA. So this is this is a matter of record that this stuff was never a problem. And but we decided, okay, cholesterol causes a problem. So uh, anything that lowers cholesterol is therefore good. Anything that raises cholesterol, therefore bad. Well, fasting raises your cholesterol. That's funny. You're not eating anything at all, and yet your LDL cholesterol is going up. Well, why is that? You know, so it's just because you're now running on fat and your body's mobilizing fat. That's just how it works. Um, you know, now that carnivore and keto are getting more popular, they're really trying to tear it down. I think a lot of this is funded by the food companies and the food industry. There's just trillions of dollars behind all this. And, uh, and they're paying people off. And it's just the same old story. It's been going on for 50, 100 years. And, um, and so a study just came out and said, oh, the, all these new ketogenic diets or, the, or their you know, uh, different offshoots, which are referring to a carnivore diet, I'm sure, uh, they raise your LDL cholesterol. So the oh, ketogenic diet could cause uh, increases. Yeah, I, I'm with you there. And I think that you know a lot of these are, ba- I think that was a bullshit study based yeah. on observation and you know, like a 24 hour food recall or something like yeah. that. But, but, it, but it was even worse than that. Right. Well, because yes, I mean, cause that was total bullshit and your, and your, your LDL cholesterol and everything can change dramatically. And I don't think they, they weren't even ketogenic. They were eating like no. 35% of their calories from carbohydrate or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So like, you know, it, it, Hey, it's a dumb study, but also the end point was what does your LDL do? Well, what about, do they get heart attacks or not? Right. Because when you look at that and there have been studies that looked at that, they find that people with higher LDL cholesterol have less heart attacks, have less strokes, and that people over the age of 65 and have higher LDL cholesterol, they are protected from Alzheimer's, protected from dementia, protected from Parkinson's, protected from heart disease. They live longer. They lower all-cause mortality. They stay independent longer. They don't go to nursing homes as much. So this is actually very beneficial. And this mm-hmm important molecule that we shouldn't just be damaging. And, you know, we know we're putting on a statin, so we want to lower your cholesterol. Well, this is not like a benign thing like that. That's actually doing something harmful that we don't want. And it has other side effects as well, you know, like causing dementia, you know? So, I mean, this is, this is, this is something we really, really, really need to re-examine, especially because in the last decade, there have been studies with hundreds of thousands of patients in them showing the clear benefit of higher LDL cholesterol. Now, a problem can come when you damage your LDL cholesterol. But again, that's not necessarily from the SDLDL itself. It may be used in a disease process, or there may be another disease process going on that's causing both. Right. LDL cholesterol is not a cause of this. Yeah. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm with you 100%. The whole cholesterol ideology, it's like at the end of the day, anytime we're looking for one specific thing as um, an all cause, you know, problem that in and of itself, obviously is a huge problem. What about the idea of biochemical individuality is like, listen, for one person, they might have significantly elevated LDLs being on the carnivore for another person. It might not be a a quote unquote Mm -hmm. issue whatsoever. I mean, there's relevance there in the context of like, Hey, when we zoom out and look at everything else, how is the rest of their nutrition, their lifestyle, their exercise, their sleep patterns, their hydration status, their community, you know, their sense of purpose and happiness. And speaking of all of this stuff, what about when we look to um, the blue zones and we look at the ideas, right? The, obviously you're familiar with the blue zones, but it's, you know, the areas of the world that have the most centenarians that... Mm-hmm. In addition to all of the things that I just mentioned, which I think is extremely relevant for mm-hmm. any diet that we're on, and I mentioned uh, community, I mentioned sense of purpose, I mentioned uh, movement, right, um, stress management, but these blue zones tend to be predominantly vegetarian or plant based. So, what what's your perspective on why that is the case? And kind of how we should be thinking about it. Yeah, well, so so first of all, the blue zones uh, was really like an article. It wasn't like an actual full-on study where they identified all these different areas. They cherry-picked very specific areas that they could make their case from. 
Um, and not all of them were actually all that plant-based. So again, you know, Americans are 70% plant-based. Just a lot of it is processed plant. Sure. And sure. so a lot of these places are really just eating whole foods. I think that's the main difference. One thing that, you know, they talk about o Okinawa and the blue zone studies. Uh, the thing with Okinawa is they, they talk, they'll specifically talk about how they eat hardly any red meat. And they say that very specifically because in fact, they eat a lot of pork, right? Mm. And so they eat, they actually eat more meat than the Japanese population that they're being compared to. So they say, oh, look at these guys live so much longer than the, than the rest of the Japanese people. It's because of these beets. That's what it is. You know, okay, well, all the other populations aren't eating those beets. So, you know, what is it? We're just supposed to eat any random plant. No, no animal does that on earth. None. You know, they eat very, very specific things. You know, the idea that, oh, well, we'll all eat different things. And they're all different, uh, you know, better or, you know, for, for different people, some you know, different optimal things. That doesn't make sense biologically. All animals have a specific for animal species will have a specific uh diet that is optimal for them hmm, sure so there there i don't I, I challenge anyone to do this and I've, I've yet to sort of get an answer but you know maybe maybe someone hearing this will think of one but i cannot think of one single example of two members of the same species anywhere in the world that have different optimal diets now maybe you can be better or worse able to process suboptimal diets but that doesn't change what's optimal, right? And so, you know, if, if they're supposed to be eating beets, then we should all be eating beets, right? And they only exist there. So obviously that didn't work when we were coming out of Africa. So uh, a lot of problems there. Um, also, you can't get basic nutrition just from eating plants. You're never going to get enough. You're never going to get B12, D3, K2. You never get enough vitamin A. You'd have to eat six pounds of carrots a day to, eat, to get enough vitamin A. All the essential fatty acids, saturated fats, cholesterol is actually an essential uh, nutrient as well. DHA, EPA, none of these things exist in plants and we don't make them uh, to the extent that we need them uh, ourselves. You, so you do need to get them from your body. 70% of the solid matter of your brain is, is lipids and fat. You know, 20% of those lipids are DHA, right? So you need these things. They're very, very important. They don't come from plants. So first of all, you, if anything, we at least need to include meat in our diet. You have to. But as far as the blue zone specifically, again, a lot of these, a lot of these areas are actually eating more meat, more meat than what course. it's they're led to believe. Well, they're, they're, exactly. So, so in, in Okinawa, they're actually eating a lot more, you know, pork and meat, you know, eating a large percentage of their diet as plant-based it's whole food plant-based as opposed to uh, processed plant-based. Well, you compare anything to a Western diet and it's going to be, well, it's right. going to contribute yeah. significantly more to longevity, right? I, I, exactly. Kind of yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And so I, I agree, you know, just going to whole foods is going to make a, a big difference, plant-based or meat-based, you know, one thing that they don't talk about is two other blue zones that are, that are quite significant and have much longer uh, lifespans and expectancies. One of those is Hong Kong, which has the highest life expectancy from birth on earth. They eat the most meat per capita on earth except for like indigenous populations like the Maasai or something like that, that just eat you know, way more. And the Maasai would actually live to be a great age too. Now their average from birth is about 60 years, but that's because they have such a high infant mortality rate because they're, they're right. giving birth out in, in a hut. And so there's a high infant mortality rate. And, and um, or they're just eating, what What are they, the Maasai, they're eating meat, milk, and blood basically, blood. right? Yeah, just like, just like the uh, Mongol, you know, Genghis Khan and the Mongol empire. They just ate yeah. horse, horse blood. Um, fermented uh, mare's milk and things like that. And they were, they were they now we're talking. You know, well, dude, listen, now Asian you've got Africa. like your, your spin on the carnivore diet. Um, yeah. I want to, I really want to respect your time. So I want to okay. kind of, there's a couple of things I want to dive into in terms of practicality and like, let's talk through, okay. Like how does someone get started? Let's go from the average dude who's like corporate America executive, like couple kids at home, you know, rolling through Starbucks first thing in the morning, the wife's cooking dinner and grabbing a quick lunch with clients. Like, where do we start with something like this? If ideally, you know, obviously we want to improve our health. We want to drive some weight loss. We're intrigued by the idea of going more carnivore. What would you say are the first steps? Well, I think, I think the first steps are really cutting out those processed carbs and sugar, alcohol, especially, and, and just focusing more on meat and eating more fatty meat. I think one of the most beneficial things to do with this way of eating is, is the, is the sheer convenience and ease of it. Because when you're eating high density nutrition, you don't need to eat as much or as often. So I eat 
I eat much less now. And I I'd only generally like once a day. So I will eat in the evening. If I eat a very you know, large or even a couple large fatty steaks, you know, then, then I, 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 I'm generally not hungry for like another 24 hours. So I wake up in the morning. I'm not hungry. I don't need to. When, what time of day do you train? If, if I train, I'm, I'm, you know, with work and everything like that. And yeah, and, you obviously have a few uh, things on your plate. Yeah. Uh, it's usually after work. Yeah. So I'll usually, you know, work all day, won't eat breakfast, don't need lunch, don't stop for dinner, anything like that. I you know, train after work and then I go home, have, you know, a couple big steaks and then I'm just chill the rest of the night. And, uh, and I usually don't need to eat anything the next day until I, I complete all that. Now, if I'm working out regularly and heavily, uh, my body will just need more. I'll need more nutrients. I'll need more calories and I'll, I'll put on muscle very easily. And so I'll need to eat more. So then I, I sometimes will eat twice a day. So maybe, you know, I'll, I'll eat all that. I'll eat to the point I want to eat to the point that my body is telling me to stop. And usually you can do that by taste. Your, your, your hunger signals are much more subtle on a carnivore diet. So I think taste is a very good marker for that. If meat tastes good, especially fatty meat, then that I think that that's your body giving you a positive feedback saying, hey, we want these nutrients. Let's, let's bring those in. Eventually it is going to taste less and less good. And it'll get to the point where you're just like, I'm not really enjoying this. It's the same piece of meat cooked at the same time in the same conditions. And yet it tastes entirely different. First, it tasted amazing. And now it's like, Ugh, I, I could really, I really could just leave it. And then you just leave it. And, um, and it's very satiating. So then you, you don't have to really eat after that. Then the next day, you know, maybe I'll have those leftovers and maybe look good again in the morning. So I just listen to my body. And I think that, um, if you, if you do that and you just eat fatty meat until you're full, especially in your evening meal, you'll find that you're much less hungry throughout the day. And so you don't, you don't need to worry about breakfast. You're not going to be scrounging around for lunch and for snacks and things like that. Uh, especially people with extra excess, uh, you know, fat and adipose tissue, you'll find that your body starts uh, prioritizing using that first. So you actually don't eat nearly as much. When I got down to a stable body fat percentage, my, my appetite literally doubled. I started eating twice as much as I was before, because now my body's like, wait, we got to maintain this. Now we're not actually just going to run on our fat. So, um, I find that, that it's actually quite easy to do this. In, in fact, it's, it's much more easy to do this on a very busy schedule. Like you're, you're a doctor in residency where I'm you know, doing a 36 hour shift and I can't eat. I'm fine. You know, I, I, I'm not hangry. I'm not freaking out. I feel good. And then when I get to a point where I can eat, I eat a bunch of steak and I feel great. What about the, like, what do we see as far as the differences with the type of meat, you know, grass fed versus commercially raised, you know, um, CAFO farm, obviously it matters what the animal eats, especially if we're talking mm -hmm. about like vitamins and minerals that we're trying yeah. to extract out of, and, and the quality of the fat, omega-6, omega-3 fatty acids. Like, I don't know, you know, dig into that just yeah. briefly. Yeah, no, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, grass fed and finished beef is going to be better. In fact, older cows actually have a higher nutrient density profile as well. You just have more time to, to pack in the nutrients, uh, especially in the fat. Um, you're right. The omega-3 profile is going to be better than, uh, in the grass fed and finished uh, animals like cows. When you start grain feeding, it starts sort of getting rid of the omega-3s and the omega-6s go up a bit. Um, there's some studies that suggest that after about three months in a feedlot, the cow, the fat basically has no uh, omega threes anymore. It's mm -hmm. just low omega threes. Um, you know, if you look at just the general USDA sort of uh, markers, the, it's it's very generic. It's very general that they see in the average for the average sort of uh, um, you know uh, animal that comes out. But if you look at the regenerative farmers, because that makes a big difference. You know what they're doing to the land. If they're doing it in a regenerative fashion, that makes the land more healthy, more fertile. Right more nutrients in it. And then that nutrient nutrients get into the grass, which gets into the cow, which goes back into the ground and generation after generation, that soil gets healthier and healthier and the cows get more healthy and healthy and more nutritious as well. So I saw a guy, he was giving a lecture at um, Hillsdale college. It was about regenerative agriculture. He's like, I've been doing this the same way that people have been doing for, you know, 10 generations before me. And, um, and so they never had any problems with you know, supply lines of this. They were all completely self-sufficient. They didn't need feed. They didn't need hay. Their ground was extremely fertile and the nutrients in their meat and their eggs was way more than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Example he gave was folate. So like in a normal egg that you would get at a store, uh, it would have like 41 grams of folate or something like that, milligram or, you know, uh, milligrams of folate or whatever, whatever it was, whatever unit, but his had over a thousand of that same unit, right? So it was it was a massive, massive increase. So 
the ideal would be going to, you know, a local regenerative farmer, you know, buying your eggs there, buying chickens there, buying a side of beef there, a whole cow. I did that. I went to a, a guy here in Washington State in Clay Ellum and got a whole cow and it was 10 years old. It was the best thing I've ever tasted in my entire life. It was just packed with nutrition. And I was just like teeming with energy. If you can't do that, store-bought steak, grain finished steak is still better than any alternative. So I think of it as sort of gold and silver at the Olympics, right? So silver play, silver medalists lost to gold, right? But the silver medalists also beat everyone else on earth. And so that's how I sort of think about it. Whereas if, if you can get the grass fed and finished from a regenerative farm, that is absolutely the ideal. And I, I do think that just looking from a nutrition uh you know, component standpoint and nutrition density, hands down, that's the best way to go. But just eating normal store-bought meat, which is predominantly what I do, um, because that's just what I have access to where I am, that is better than any other thing you can possibly eat. And I think it's it's absolutely good enough. I think you, you would do very, very well doing that. There's some research from uh, Dr. Sean Baker and his company, Rivero Health. They have over 12,000 patients that they cataloged and, and, and looked at a lot of different markers. And they found that for the health endpoints and outcomes, you know, looking at, you know, vitamin deficiencies and health and, you know, chronic illnesses and things like that, they really didn't see a difference between those who ate just grass fed and finished and, and grain finished. So for, for those sorts of outcomes, for those sort of short-term outcomes, uh, there, there really wasn't a significant difference. I think objectively, you can see there are differences. There are, there is yeah. a of nutrition nutrients in there, but for, for practical purposes, you're, you're actually still doing very, very well on, on the grain finished beef. And it's certainly better than eating any, anything the cow was going to eat. Right. So it's yeah. And, and it sounds meat. like it's kind of splitting hairs to some degree, especially for coming again from like the standard American right. diet It's like, listen, you, yeah. you're going to ramp up your protein intake by virtue of, you know, eating more red meat, eating fattier meats. That's going to crowd out a lot of the more processed grains and processed fats that you would normally be consuming. It's going to provide better quality nutrients. Uh, again, more protein. It's going to be more satisfying for you. You're going to be less likely to consume as many calories throughout the day. Mm -hmm. What we're hearing and what you know what we're seeing and and what you're stipulating is you know that significant contributor to weight loss, which makes perfect sense. I mean, every client that we work with, the direction we move them in is like, listen, we need to ramp up your protein intake to be able to do all of the things that we just said, right? Yeah. And to 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 move, if nothing else, move to a more whole foods based diet, and then should you choose, clearly. Oh based on so much of the stuff that we discussed today, it makes a lot of sense to start to remove um, a lot of the plants that we are consuming to improve upon overall health, performance, weight loss, digestion, blood markers, all of those types of things. Yeah, that sounds great, man. Before I let you go, how can people find out more about you and, and like, what are you working on right now? People can usually find me on, on social media. Like I'm, I'm pretty active on Instagram, uh, just Anthony Chafee MD. And that's the same for my uh, YouTube as well. It's just Anthony Chafee MD. And I have over a hundred videos and interviews that I do on there and talking about carnivore diet and benefits. I have a, a playlist if people really want to, you know, take a look at some of the, you know, sort of the seminal uh, videos. Uh, it's, it's a playlist I put on my channel called the carnivore starter kit. And I think that's a very good place for people to, to go to and start uh, if they want to sort of learn a lot about this. And, um, and then I have a, a podcast, uh, just called the plant free MD as, as, uh, you know, just from my, my origins here. It makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. And, uh, and anyone can find that on any, any sort of podcast, um, platform. And, and currently, yeah, I'm currently working on a book, trying to talk about all this, talk, go into the background, go into the history of it, talk about, you know, different aspects of nutrition and diet and bioavailability and why this is the best way for us to, to eat and why we should avoid other things, but also to make the overarching argument that in medicine, the so-called chronic diseases that we're treating these days are not diseases per se, but in fact, toxicities and malnutrition. So a toxic buildup of yeah. appropriate diet and a lack of species specific nutrition, namely too many plants that were not designed to, to uh, process properly and not enough meat. And, and by chronic diseases, I'm meaning 
heart disease, diabetes, even cancer, autoimmune diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and even neurodevelopmental delays such as autism. There's very strong evidence that autism is, is diet related. People are having very, very good results with people, even as adults with autism, going on a ketogenic diet. It makes their brains sure. work better and increases the number of their mitochondria and the functionality of their mitochondria as well, which makes their brain work better, which makes them uh, able to, to function better and more normally. And it's even more important in kids because that's when their brain is developing. So if you, if you get, if you are able to correct the development, they may not have as much of a problem in the future anyway. So I think it's very, very important um, that we, that we look at this and understand this because it's affecting so much of our lives. Like I said, the natural state of humanity is to be healthy and yet we're not almost no one is. And so no. it's directly coming from the food that we're eating. I agree a hundred percent around a significant portion of obesity being a disease of malnutrition without mm -hmm. question. And it, it makes perfect sense given the state of our, you know, diet industry. And then second to that and little hack for, for those of you guys that are listening with respect to kids, nutrition, eating enough fat, eating enough protein. I could not agree enough. One of the the, the tips I have for you for what it's worth is if you want to start your kid's day right, get them eating higher fat uh, red meat for breakfast. I, this has uh, been a game changer in our house. When we feed our kids steak uh, for breakfast, they all do incredibly well, can concentrate, have good energy throughout the day, are less irritable, respond better to instruction, better cognitive function, you name it. And we know this very clearly from the literature as well. So I'm glad that you mentioned kids because it really does that make a huge difference. So dude, thank you so much uh, for your time. I know you got a lot of stuff going on. I'm super grateful um, to have had the opportunity to catch up with you again and, and um, keep up the good work, man. You're doing well, great. thank you, man. You too. And thank you so much for having me on. It's great to see you again. It's, uh, it's cool that you're, you're doing this in this space. I think it's great to get as, as many voices out there as possible, you know, getting the information out there because, you know, people can really just revolutionize their lives and their health and take back control of their health and not be reliant on doctors and the medical system, which I, I, I think it should be a secondary, you know, catch, not a you know, primary. This is just how you have to, you have to go them all the time just to stay tuned up. I don't think you should yeah. Do that if that right. if you're doing that then there's a problem you got to be proactive one of the things that i'm so adamant about is you don't have to go all in right out of the gate i think everyone mm -hmm. wants to kind of go all or nothing and and obviously this is something that's been a significant portion of your life that you've slowly adapted to and learned from and changed your behaviors and especially if you know it's different as a, a 20 year old kid to a, a 40 something year old adult with responsibilities and a job to be able to make that change. And so what I would encourage people to do is as long as you're being proactive and, and putting in the steps to uh, be, keep it realistic, slowly start making those changes, you'll start to feel better. You'll start to look better. You'll, you'll be more motivated and you'll progressively adapt. And, and so regardless of how aggressive you want to be, you got to keep it realistic. So Thanks, brother, for your insight. Keep up the great work, and uh, I'll catch up with you soon. It's been a pleasure being here.